In this talk today, some of the concerns I've had in the past of find a new home in 1950s America, which is um, in some ways new space for me, even though I grew up within it, um, but nonetheless I've never studied it this way before. So I propose here in this paper uh, to link the topic of modernism and rhetoric to the question, does modernism today matter? And spoiler alert, I'm going to say that it does. Surprise, surprise. But we're finished. Um, and having listened to the papers today, the richness of the evocation of various aspects of the rhetorical tradition, which is much more highly developed here, I think, than it is in Anglophone criticism, uh, I will admit that this, this talk is less directly situated within that than it might be, and perhaps you can help me situate it a little more closely by the time I'm finished. So my title has three key terms, modernism, the corporation, and the university. And if I were to treat each with equal rigor, uh, I'd just have to speak much, long, speak much longer than your patience would allow. So instead, uh, first let me offer just one postulate that will make no effort to prove. Owing to the fragmentation of knowledge into discrete disciplines over the turn of the 20th century, the modern university itself uh, is a modernist construct, or at least it was early in the 20th century. What it may be now uh, is a more difficult question. For about 20 years, the emerging field of university studies has lamented the increasing corporatization of the university. This critique was advanced most forcefully, I would say, back in 1997 by Bill Reddings in his book, The University in Ruins, which argues, uh, to brutally simplify it, uh, that whereas the university once functioned, uh, and he's thinking back to classic German models, uh, once function to train individuals as national subjects. In the age of globalization and universal commodification, the university is in danger of simply training student consumers to take their place in the global economy. Argument being that the nation state is no longer available in the same way to be the telos towards which individuals grow within the university. And he had a notion of the university coming out of the German tradition as being basically a building drawn. Uh, and that no longer being possible. Uh, to link that question of university to modernism, I want to call attention to two things. On the one hand, to Lionel Trilling's lament in 1961 that the university classroom had domesticated modern literature, dulling the edge of its anti-bourgeois critique by sheeting it in syllabi. And on the other, to one of those disgraced founders of modernism, Ezra Pound, who in his pre-fascist Arnoldian phase argued that a renaissance of great literature devoted to precision of expression would, quote, give us lasting and unassailable data regarding the nature of man as a thinking and sentient creature. So Pound saw a use for great literature that only is it invigorating, or as he put it, provides a nutrition of impulse. It also, in all its chaotic subversiveness, restores clarity and vigor of thought. Now granted, the concept of hygiene, and Pound uses it in connection with a, that very word hygiene, in connection with the cleansing of information channels. Um, coming from Pound, it must give us pause, but I propose to ignore for now the retrospective shiver of national hygiene in favor of the usable aspects of Pound's dicta. Finally, in thinking of the corporation, I mean to take seriously Peter Drucker's influential statement in 1946 that, quote, the emergence of big business, in other words, the large integrated industrial unit as a social reality over the first half of the 20th century is the most important event in the recent social history of the Western world. Uh, and with that bold claim, which is Drucker's, uh, I turn now for the rest of this paper to an experimental educational space in which, uh, during the Cold War, in which modernism, university, and the corporation uh, play key roles. So my corporation here is AT&T, or they'll refer to it alternately, the Bell system. Uh, this was, Bell systems were not, was not broken up into multiplicities until uh, 1980, uh, but it still had individual branches, and this is about Pennsylvania Bell. Um, the experiment was a 10-month educational program for Bell System Middle Management that ran from 1953 to 1960. Initiated by the phone company and designed and run in collaboration with the University of Pennsylvania, 
It was called the Institute of Humanistic Studies for executives. Enrolling 17 executives, that's, that's the surprising part, isn't it? Didn't mean that in jam, not to sort of, I skip. Enrolling 17 executives in its first year, the program provided nearly a year's sabbatical leave from the business world at full pay. Over the 10 months, the participants were immersed in the liberal arts through intensive readings, lectures, and seminar discussions. The program included no applied business training of any kind. On the contrary, it is no exaggeration to say that the program was originally designed to culminate in the reading of James Joyce's Ulysses. According to John Markle II, Vice President of the Bell Telephone Company of Pennsylvania, the inclusion of Ulysses was the pet project of the program's initial designer and its first director, Morse Peckham, at the time Associate Professor of English at the University of Pennsylvania. Now, I, I myself am, among other things, a Joyce scholar, as Sasha mentioned, and I have to admit that it was the vision of Bell executives in the 1950s, sitting down to a six-week course in Ulysses, that first <coughs> drew me to this project. What was the perceived value of Ulysses in this context? And what did the student executives themselves think about the experience? And these questions then have led to broader ones. What was the Institute for Humanistic Study itself supposed to accomplish? And does its history offer any lessons for the fate of the humanities and modernism today? Despite my interest in Joyce and modernism, however, my archive for this project is not primarily a literary one. Instead, it includes a mass of administrative memos, planning papers, and press releases housed at the University of Pennsylvania Library, another mass of papers from the AT&T corporate archives in Warren, New Jersey, a set of transcriptions from tape recordings made by student executives 10 years after the end of the program from the archives of the History of American Psychology at the University of Akron in Ohio, and a number of accounts of the program published in popular magazines at the time. And yet the yield I seek is in part a literary one, at least insofar as literary studies can still stand as a synecdoche for liberal arts more generally. And here, here of course, I need to invoke the ancient Latin studia humanitas, a curriculum referenced by Cicero, refined in the Renaissance, the study of grammar, rhetoric, history, moral philosophy, and poetry. Ezra Pound, again, frustrated classicist as he was, championed the revival of a related program in his early essays. So with this context in mind, let me return to the account of the Institute. Uh, the 10 month course of study was organized into three broad areas, philosophy, the arts, and science, or philosophy, the arts, and science. Philosophy included four courses, practical logic, logic social and ethical values, and the philosophy of science. Six courses were devoted to the arts, world literature, how to read a novel, Ulysses, world art, uh, modern architecture and city planning, and the history and aesthetics of music. Science included seven courses, but that number is a little misleading uh, since that uh, category included social science and the historical sciences. This substantial 10-month curriculum was supplemented with guest lectures by university faculty. Kenneth Apple, chairman of the Department of Psychiatry, lectured on psychiatric theories of personality. Professor of Chinese studies lectured on Confucianism and Chinese lyrics. Visiting Professor Lewis Mumford lectured on the medieval city. Professors of literature lectured on Shakespeare, Thomas Mann, Eugene O'Neill, Ernest Hemingway. A nuclear physicist spoke on elementary particles and atoms, and so on. But even more impressive was the startling array of outside speakers. Those were all people from within the University of Pennsylvania. According to one Penn observer, in the first year of the program, 160 of America's leading intellectuals came to campus to address the Bell executives. Yes, 160. To give you a small sample, R.P. Blackmer lectured on the tale of Genji. Claude Shannon from Bell Labs spoke on communication theory. Delmore Schwartz came to talk about the brothers Karamazov. Eric Fromm lectured on psychology and ethics. William Tyndall lectured on Joyce's portrait. Alfred Kazin on World War I's impact on American society. Also giving guest lectures were W.H. Auden, Cubist sculptor Jacques Lipschitz, Henry Steele Commager and Virgil Thompson, and many more. The second year the list of speakers seems to have been cut back to a more modest number, only 100. 
The program also organized trips to the United Nations, Philadelphia orchestra concerts, and museums in New York, Washington, and Philadelphia, as well as art exhibitions and theatrical performances. One morning, they were also treated to a bassoon demonstration. I'm confident that most of you here will share my sense that this sounds like the greatest sabbatical year ever. No expectation of producing any new work, just a huge reading list and a constant stream of diverse speakers. What's more, after the first year, AT&T also paid for the families of the participants to spend a year at the university because they had complained the first year that they missed their families. <laughs> All the students uh, who averaged about 37 years of age were men, white men, but many events and lectures were open to wives and families and some special program was devised for them as well beginning in the second year. In the second year's cohort, and I take this to be um, representative, uh, a third of the executives had only a high school education as was not uncommon in corporations at, at this time. And of the college graduates, most were engineers or business school men. AT&T paid the tuition of $12,000 per student a year, which in today's dollars comes to approximately $100,000 a student, or annually nearly $2 million, or 1.8 million euros. Of course, AT&T benefiting enormously from the post-war economic boom in the US and from the huge increase in telephone use during World War II was a hugely profitable corporation at this time. So those are some of the bare facts to give you a sense of the scale of this thing. And I'll return for different kinds of account later. But first I want to acknowledge what might be a distinct trap uh, that could be called Cold War nostalgia. There was a lot of money for the humanities in the 1950s because it was felt by leaders in government and industry in the United States that the liberal arts would cultivate the kind of free thinking, creativity, and individualism that would defeat the communist automatons. But if the 50s were a time of milk and honey owned to the funds channeled into the liberal arts by the Ford Foundation and other government agencies, there's a growing body of scholarship about the darker side of the weaponizing of literary studies. For the quasi-paranoid version, one can consult the aptly titled The Mighty Wurlitzer, How the CIA Played America by Hugh Wilford. There's another, another solid book, Francis Saunders, The Cultural Cold War, on this. Um, but that's not my interest here. Uh, I'm not interested in producing a gothic thriller about how evil foundations and shadowy government agencies turned the mid-century humanities into a Frankenstein's monster, the kind of story which figures into criticism primarily as a stalking horse, the CIA's efforts to prop up authoritarian regimes in Latin America. Some of that work is very good, but it also seems to depend on kind of conspiratorial logic whereby the content of some of the things that were funded by the CIA is automatically implicated in a certain ideology, even though there's no necessary connection. Um, all right. So the founders of the Institute conceived of it very differently as a kind of upbeat building trauma, a space of highly compressed education in which the individual would grow into a more engaged relation to the modern world. The president of Pennsylvania Bell at this time was W.D. Gillen, who was also a University of Pennsylvania trustee. As Bell Vice President uh, Markle describes it, President Gillen and I <coughs> felt that what was needed was some kind of a program that would sharpen the individual's creative insight, widen his frame of reference to many fields of human behavior, and provide him with some techniques with which he could test the logic and consistency of his behavior. This is a standard uh, articulation of the liberal arts, obviously. But why this felt needed this time for these telephone executives? Two words come up repeatedly in justification of the program, over-specialization and excessive conformity. As Markle saw it, a former generation of business managers had necessarily turned inward during the Great Depression to problems of production, sales, finance, and technological development as industry had to convert to the war. <coughs> After the war, however, the corporation had to turn outward to consider itself, he thought, in relation to the community, to the nation, and to the world. Those are Markle's words. The science of industrial management, it was thought, had solved the technical issues earlier that turned the liberal arts, it was hoped, would solve problems of human affairs, by creating more flexible, creative, and worldly business leaders. Outsiders did not always see the problem and solution in equally idealistic terms. The title of an article, article in The Nation excuse me, sums up a more skeptical perspective. And the title was Finishing School for Executives. 
But if AT&T's program was innovative, and it certainly was, one could also see that AT&T was innovating within a structure of concerns that was emerging from the relatively new field of management studies, which did not exist until Peter Drucker, a professor of politics and philosophy at Bennington College, published Concept of the Corporation in 1946. Um, more on Drucker, who also coined the term knowledge worker in 1959, another book uh, later. A really fascinating figure and I'm just starting to read now. Pulling back a bit, we can see that the Institute for Humanistic Study was very much a child of the early 20th century's information explosion and the Cold War, even if they didn't see it in precisely those terms. Information services in the late 40s and early 50s were poor, and job specialization was one way to manage the growth of information. Te technical training in computing and other specialized services contributed both to the narrowing of expertise and to anxieties about automation, quantification, and conformist thinking. Thus, there is a deep historical logic to the decision by AT&T, the largest communications company in the world, to invoke the liberal arts as a solution to a crisis in information processing. The concomitant anxieties about conformity were most influentially art articulated in 1956 by William White's landmark book, The Organization Man. The widespread discussions of conformity as a serious cultural problem had already been initiated earlier in the decade. White himself coined the term groupthink in an article in Fortune magazine in 1952. And in 1950, David Reisman, one of the many speakers to visit the Institute, published The Lonely Crowd, another landmark book, a sociological study of modern conformity that was included in the crate of 85 books student exec execs were given on arrival. The Cold War. Cold War, of course, was in, in its infancy at this time, and among the many anxieties triggered by the Soviet testing of the atomic bomb in 1949 was the fear that the Soviets were training far more engineers and scientists than were the U.S. Efforts to close this gap became a priority, but the comprehensive American mobilization also included renewed attention to the liberal arts. One of the most influential voices warning against the myopic, myopic focus on technological advancement came from what may seem an unexpected source. Clarence Randall, former head of the Inland Steel Company, who, quote, believed that a properly cultivated mind would offset technical hypnosis and over-specialization. This argument gained a great deal of favor not only in English and art history departments across the land, but in the business world and the U.S. government. The liberal, liberal arts would help resist Soviet domination by fostering individualism and the value of freedom. And ironically, today it is China that is turning to liberal arts, just as the UK and the US seem to be cutting back. The University of Pennsylvania was happy to sign on. It would be good publicity for the university, and the Pet administration seems genuinely to have believed in the mutual value of collaboration between the business world and the university. Despite this Cold War context, though, the Institute for Humanistic Study did not function as an instrument of anti-communist propaganda. This is surprising that, given that during the same period, US, the US government in collaboration with a wide range of private entities was actively engaged in efforts to use US art, especially abstract expressionism, and US writers, including William Faulkner, as part of a comprehensive effort of cultural propaganda that went under the name of cultural diplomacy. And there's a great book coming out um, in the next few weeks by Greg Bonheisel on this um, information about Faulkner abroad, um, who was pretty much just a constant drunk by this time, uh, trying to act as a US diplomat. Pretty, pretty entertaining. Um, no doubt the relatively non-propagandistic profile of the Institute for Humanistic Study derived from its location within the university which then has now housed a great deal of oppositional critical energy, and also from the fact that the Institute was designed not for transnational display, but as a new form of executive training. These young executives, to be sure, were being trained to make AT&T more competitive in an increasingly globalized economy, which they called internationalized economy. But to the extent that they were being turned into cold warriors, this was so only in the sense that they were being cultivated as individuals with a heightened appreciation of the humanities. 
So even as cultural expressions of, of the U.S. liberal tradition were being mobilized for persuasive purpose by the government and allied agencies, there's no evidence that the founders of the Institute, unlike, say, Nelson Rockefeller's Office of Inter-American Affairs, self-consciously construed individualism per se as a weapon in the Cold War. Rather, the 1950s saw broad non-governmental interest in adult education with a great variety of programs springing up all over the country. And although belief in a great books curriculum as an antidote to over-specialization dates back at least to the 1920s in the United States, it was in 1952 that Robert Hutchins and Mortimer Adler of the University of Chicago founded the Great Books of the Western World publishing project through the Encyclopedia Britannica, a project designed in large part with business people in mind. The Penn AT&T collaboration was thus only the most intensive and prolonged experiment among many that focused on infusing executive training with education and humanities. So at this point, I want to spend a little time recovering a sense of Penn's liberal arts classroom uh, in the 50s. And in visiting the archive, I'll acknowledge again that as a scholar of modernism, literary modernism, I'm particularly interested in the, the literature classes. Evidence of what actually went on in the classroom is scanty but suggestive. A list of required textbooks is extant, but I have not found any lecture notes or lesson plans. Worse, from the perspective of the Joycean, eager to get back to the moment of reading in the 1950s, there are only a few comments specifically about Ulysses. There's reason to believe, however, that its inclusion was one of the more controversial aspects of the program. The other really controversial thing was that Pound was awarded the Bollinger Prize during the Institute, and people argued about that as well. I really like to have heard those conversations. Um, according to one uh, account in the AT&T archives, written by a participant I was able to identify as William Cashel, some student executives thought the book was too difficult and should be dropped. But Cashel believed after the first year that Ulysses should remain in the curriculum because it stimulated so much discussion and so many different perspectives. Cashel called the literature curriculum in general a great success and opined that in working his way through a wide selection of world and contemporary literature, he came to believe that in the past he, quote, missed a great deal of value by not reading more. He also singles out Ulysses as one of the several books from the course I will read again. Cashel wrote his detailed report in the program, the only one of its kind I've been able to find, very soon after completing the, uh, completing the curriculum, probably within a few weeks. Uh, I've tried to track him down to find out, among other things, whether he ever did visit, uh, revisit Ulysses, but he died in 2000 at the age of 80 having become president of Campbell Soup. <laughs> Other comments about Ulysses tend to crop up in articles whose positive take on the program owe much to publicity releases by the university and in pieces written by instructors. Of course, the university is very proud of the notion that they had these executives reading Ulysses, right? It's the equivalent, as I was saying the other night, to uh, Sasha, I think, of a you know, picture of Marilyn Monroe reading Ulysses, an incongruity. Um, uh, it was good publicity, they, they figured. Um, Instructors, though, uh, wrote about this as well. Thus, historian Arthur Dutton, who recounts some engaging anecdotes about anti-union students who came to see organized labor more sympathetically after reading about the 1886 Chicago Haymarket riot, and about three panels of students who staged a debate about the economic arguments of Adam Smith, Marx, and Keynes, uh, Dutton also tells the story of an accountant whose initial antagonism toward Ulysses disappeared after preparing a report on the Sirens episode. A dance band musician in college, the accountant ended up spending 42 hours preparing his presentation and ultimately exclaimed, you know, this man Joyce is something for everybody if he looks hard enough. <laughs> At the other end of the spectrum, an article in Esquire records a more skeptical student opinion. My God, some of the other stuff we get. Did you ever read Ulysses? But James Joyce, it's just a big pile of dirt. That article, by the way, was written by a man with a lovely name, John Keats. <laughs> <laughs> the Esquire article also makes a few professors look bad in particular ways, quoting one of them as saying that before the program began, he was expecting savages, Philistines, businessmen, babbits, executives, Texans. But he, was <laughs> <laughs> but he was pleased later to find that they were merely bright, eager, and ignorant. <laughs> The article also gives lots of airtime to one of the Joyce instructors, David Mallory, 
who argues that while some greatly resisted Ulysses, all ultimately realized, even the one who called it a pile of dirt, uh, that, quote, far from belaboring something too long, uh, they ultimately were dazzled rather than irritated by the many styles and the virtuosity. There's very little interest in the connection with the Odyssey. Great interest in Bloom as a person, perhaps as a representative of themselves. And they were very interested in the vision of life the book gave. Of course, one suspects some bias effect here as well. As all instructors know, we tend to describe our courses in rather positive terms when anyone is willing to listen. Nonetheless, these glimpses are tantalizing. And with respect to the teaching of Ulysses, one can try to build on such, on such glimpses by rereading what the archives reveal was the one book of Joyce criticism assigned in the course, Richard M. Cain's Fabulous Voyager, first published in 1947. It's a book that stands up pretty well for many reasons. From Cain, they would have learned that the two basic themes of Ulysses are social criticism and philosophical relativity. The first somewhat submerged, the second considerably magnified. And really, one could do worse than to start with these broad notions. But Cain was also very interested in style and writes well, not only about art as a critique of values, but about the various technical means through which Ulysses generates, quote, a narrative pattern of its own, independent of Homer, and independent of the kind of esoteric symbolism emphasized by one of the few other guys to Ulysses available at the time, Stuart Gilbert's trot. A number of questions press in here. Can we imagine a foreseeable future in which business leaders would think it a good idea to ask their young executives to sit through eight three-hour seminars in Ulysses? The expense of time alone suggests not, and in fact the gloriously prolonged 10 months of the AT&T program, as we'll see, contributed to its demise. The bigger question is, can we imagine a future in which the liberal arts, epitomized for the architect of AT&T's program by Ulysses, is thought to have distinctive value, not only in the business world and engineering, but in the higher reaches of government? Some questions, such questions, seem self-evidently silly to most people outside the university these days, and sadly to some inside as well. Much of the seeming absurdity uh, of the questions derives from a presumed antithesis between the liberal arts and vocational training, a long-standing presumption shared on both sides of the divide. Various initiatives in the U.S. to reinvigorate the liberal arts in recent years have attempted to challenge the foundational nature of the distinction between vocational <coughs> and liberal training by rethinking the category of usefulness and by asking how a freshly articulated understanding of the usefulness of the liberal arts could be distributed throughout the educational system, not just cordoned off, say, in English departments. This seems to me to be the heart of the matter. How can the category of usefulness be expanded without being absorbed into the inductiveness of a purely vocational or instrumental vision? Clearly, in the 1950s, AT&T saw a kind of use value in Ulysses and in the liberal arts that has lost its purchase in most public discourse today. But in order to get beyond uncritical nostalgia for a time when public and private investment was funneled toward the liberal arts, it's necessary to look deeper into the aims of the Institute and ask whether it got results. And so to these issues, I turn now. As I've indicated, the curriculum included much more than, than Ulysses. Uh, but the program's initial designer um, did put it in the Institute's closing sequence uh, because, as he argued in his founding manifesto, Humanistic Education for Business Executives, the reading of Ulysses in and of itself for him amounted to a program in the liberal arts. If here Peckham appears to be echoing the notion of modernist encyclopedism as theorized by Ezra Pound and practiced by Joyce and others, his explicit comments tend to be more understated. He describes Ulysses as expressive of the modern temper and as a representation of life in the modern city. But we can speculate about additional reasons for paying such disproportionate attention to a single book in a course of executive training. As Joe Kelly has described so well in his book, uh, Our Joyce, in the early 50s, Ulysses had only recently begun to emerge as a modern classic, having been considered pornographic in the United States only 20 years earlier. To the extent that the program was meant to jar participants out of familiar patterns of thought, and to encourage more broad-minded experimental thinking. That is, the, to the extent that the program itself was a kind of exercise in popular modernism, Ulysses probably seemed like a good bet. In fact, a great deal of Peckham's idealistic language describing his vision of the program 
draws on a long tradition of romantic revolt fused with modernist critiques of routinization. And there's much to admire in Peckham's account, as well as in his broader prescient vision of interdisciplinary education, so prescient but also backward looking. Philosophy, arts, and science, he argues, should be intertwined. Quote, the great difficulty in present day college and graduate school pedagogy, he writes, is that the instructor too often behaves as if his were the only way to organize the data of his subject. So in some ways, he seems to be wanting to undo the uh, modernist fragmentation of knowledge and kind of utopian desire to transcend that and is criticizing the university itself. The solution, of course, sounds a lot like his own brainchild. Use many instructors and guest lecturers from different fields, say 160, and disciplines to help students understand the relativity of modes of organization and structure. This, for Peckham, is the key to becoming cultivated. But if Peckham and the Bell leadership found common ground, they were never perfectly aligned with one another. And here's where we see fault lines that have since widened into chasms separating today's university administrators and critics, usually faculty, of the corporatization of the university. In an article Peckham published in 1954, his main point is that, quote, the corporation should arm its executives against itself, close quote. Drawing on modernist tropes of autonomy, individualism, and liberation, Peckham pushes a vision of education as emancipation that undoubtedly is deeply appealing to most of us here today, for which the at t board probably found unnerving. For Peckham, quote, the young executive does not need training toward greater operational efficiency as much as he needs a sense of identity, independent from the company and an intellectual discipline free from anxiety. You will not be surprised to hear that even though Bell and Peckham shared a sense of the value of cultivating the self as a key to creative problem solving and innovation, Peckham soon <coughs> clashed with his AT&T collaborators and resigned as director after his first year. Correspondence between Peckham and Penn President uh, Gaylord Harnwell also indicates that Peckham felt that the Institute's oversight committee, which included two Bell executives, Markle and Gillen, were infringing on Penn's academic autonomy. by exercising too much control over the curriculum. And in pleasantly joyous coincidence, Peckham's detailed letter describing how he thought the oversight committee should be restructured was written in 1955 on Bloomsday. And yet Markle and, and Gillen don't come out looking like corporate villains when one looks into the dispute. The examples of interference cited by Peckham in his letters to the president seem petty and evidently were motivated in no small measure by a sense of proprietorship. He wrote to Harnwell, I feel that the institute is no longer what I created, nor what I was asked to create. Yet the Oversight Committee did not attempt to impose a corporate ideology on the curriculum or to change it much at all. The course of study included readings of Marx's Capital and encouraged a critical approach to comparative economics. The students, moreover, certainly felt the program had a politically liberal or progressive tilt. One lesson here may be that progressive academic idealism requires pragmatic leavening if collaborations with outsiders, corporate or otherwise, are to work. That is, while Peckham explicitly objects to infringement on his autonomy and by extension on the universities, in retrospect, he looks guilty of garden variety ivory towerism. He adopts a position located beyond getting and spending. He was trained as a romanticist, after all. And while this perspective is what enables critique, it also must be provisional if one wants to run an actual program. In this context, it's worth noting that the most disdainful published account of the Institute, that finishing school for executives, draws its ammunition from dismissive opinions of anonymous scholars and administrators. No one is liberated by these courses, says one. The companies believe in liberal education insofar as it doesn't work, says another. Moreover, the article itself was written by a fellow academic from Northern Illinois, Northern Illinois University, David Ray. But what did the student executives themselves think about this, about the whole program? I mentioned earlier that the archive includes recordings of participants but it actually includes much more than that. <coughs> Morris Vitalis, a Penn sociologist continuously associated with the program, subjected every graduating class to a battery of before and after tests in hope of discovering how much change could be affected over the 10-month experience. Those particular results are not extant. 
But Vitalis' follow-up study, conducted 10 years after the program ended and published in 1971, is available, as are the new materials he's gathered for that study. In this long-range <coughs> impact report, Vitalis concludes that the program was a great success and asserts that the participants showed, quote, not only significant gains in knowledge, but changes in attitudes, values, and interests. Artistic interests had ripened, and open-mindedness had crept into the evaluation and even acceptance of new and strange styles in literature, the graphic arts, and the musical composition." Close quote. Vitalis' data included both a detailed questionnaire and dictaphone recordings made by the Institute participants in response to a set of prompts. Unfortunately, as I discovered, the Ohio archive holding the data no longer has a working dictaphone. So I could not listen to the voices of the mid-century students, but I was able to get 25 copies of the 58 transcripts of the recordings that were studied by Vitalis. The rest evidently have been lost. And I, I still hope to be able to find a dictaphone somewhere, buy it, go there and listen to these things, and then donate it to the archive, which evidently does not have much money. So the participants in these transcripts were asked to assess the long-term influence of the, of the Institute in response to four prompts its impact on their managerial behavior, its effects on their decisions and how decisions were implemented, its effect on behavior relative to personnel, finances and planning, and four, its effect relative to the social, economic, and political surroundings of their business. Having studied the 25 transcripts closely, and I'm sorry to report again that not a single one mentions Ulysses, though several mention literature more generally. One of the most striking features of the transcripts is that nearly every respondent begins by stating that he finds it impossible to name a specific example of how the Institute experience has entered into his subsequent business life. And yet nearly to a man, they express a great deal of confidence in the notion that the Institute nevertheless did provide enormous, if elusive, benefits. Some suspect that the influence is subconscious, others that it is diffuse yet pervasive, and some believe that while the program might not have helped them in their business lives, it certainly enriched their lives more generally. One says it saved his marriage because he learned how to listen to his wife. Um, these initial assertions that it is difficult to pin down any specific influence or to pinpoint any particular decision informed by the experience are almost invariably followed by a gradually recovered series of positive memories about the program. The longer they speak, the more they tend to connect what they consider valuable in the present um, with the, their past at the Institute, even if they often backtrack, hedge, and wonder if what they're saying is really true. Sometimes it seems as if I were reading transcripts of psychoanalytic sessions, or, or perhaps an oddly affirmative version of the nearly contemporary play, Crap's Last Tape. Sitting alone with a tape recorder, the executives talk themselves into insights, pause the tape, and resumed later, sometimes having listened to the previous recording before taking up the thread again to revise or refine earlier thoughts. To be more specific, three concerns emerge repeatedly from the transcript. First, most men believe that the Institute taught them, as Bell executives hoped it would, a certain flexibility of mind, how to entertain multiple points of view, how to empathize with coworkers in order to see conflicts or challenges with their eyes, how to see around problems instead of jumping to conclusions. Most felt that they handled personnel issues far more effectively owing to their ability to see that emotion, not just logic, enters into complex negotiations among people. One executive asserts that what the program really taught was a kind of sensitivity, which he hastens to explain should not be associated with weakness, but with perception. Many executives also mention that these abilities help them deal with unions and labor negotiations. Second, <coughs> nearly all the respondents are eager to report on their increased engagement with social problems. Not surprisingly, given that these recordings were made in the late 60s, a large number of them comment on the Negro problem, on minorities more generally, usually African Americans, but also on Latinos, <coughs> and on the disadvantaged. Many of the executives asserted that they believe that business has a moral responsibility to try to improve race relations by instituting non-discriminatory hiring practices, but also through private sector urban renewal, job training programs, and outreach programs to secondary schools. 
nearly all felt that Bell and other companies had to step up as agents for progressive change in their communities, and a surprising number report being directly involved in socially progressive programs themselves. Of course, one should acknowledge at least two kinds of potential bias effects in relation to this data. Beyond the general problem of illusory correlation, the participants had a vested interest in demonstrating A, that they had not wasted their time 10 years earlier, and B, that they were good people whose thoughts were worth recording. But Tellus, moreover, who participated in, in the Institute for Humanistic Study from its inception, had a professional interest in demonstrating its success. Nevertheless, a third theme, less dominant but equally striking, also emerges from the transcripts, and it is one less easily dismissed as a form of bias effect. A number of executives report a lessening of commitment to the Bell system. Hence that the loosening of loyalties might result from the program emerged as early as 1954, after the second year of the program, when after an annual dinner at the Philadelphia Racket Club with the president of AT&T, student executives were asked to say something about the course. The first student comment recorded in the 1955 Harper's Magazine article observes that, quote, I still want to get along in the company, but I now realize that I owe something to myself, my family, and my community. The second notes that the course, quote, stimulated a creeping discontent and loss of complacency. But the third crystallizes what might ultimately have come to seem a problem for Bell. Before the course, one notes, I was like a straw floating with the current down the stream. The stream was the Bell Telephone Company. I don't think I will ever be like that straw again. In April 1957, an evaluation of the Institute by an outside firm confirmed that the kind of radical emancipation envisioned from the start by Morris Peckham might indeed be underway. According to this report, one third of the participants felt that as a result of the program's influence, the telephone company is no longer the be all and end all of life to them, which it was pre pen It is possible that AT&T decided that the program was succeeding all too well, and that its end in 1960 was inevitable once evidence came from a 1959 study by Vitalis, who hoped to rally support for the endangered program, that, quote, the participants became more tolerant of non-capitalistic political ideologies. This sort of evidence lends some credence to the cynical suspicion recorded in David Ray's article, Companies Believe in Liberal Education Insofar as It Doesn't Work. Yet there was more to the story than this. Among other things, documents in the Penn Archive indicate that the Bell companies were becoming increasingly less willing to let their most promising young executives take a 10-month sabbatical at full pay. And Penn's efforts to bolster numbers by soliciting participation from other corporations also failed. Although a 1960 article in Business Week observes that, quote, the reasons for the Institute's death are beclouded by the insistence of everyone connected with it that it was a success. But clearly material concerns figured powerfully. No longer willing to foot, foot the bill, AT&T wanted to shift to a tuition basis and to include executives from other companies, but too few were interested. The Business Week article reports gloom was thick at the dinner party that served as a graduate convocation for the last of the 133 student executives who passed through the program over seven years. But it also records a student comment that anticipates the transcripts recorded 10 years later. I find myself today taking a much broader view and making more critical analyses of both on and off the job problems. Decisions do not come as spontaneously, and more of the opposite viewpoint automatically registers. What can we conclude from this complex of evidence? The correlation problem remains, of course. A lot of people in the 1960s changed their mind about the role of corporations in American life. Indeed, when Peter Drucker published uh, what proved to be a massively influential case study of General Motors in 1946, and that's his book, The Concept of the Corporation, what urged General Motors most was Drucker's claim that large corporations were entangled with the public interest and should act accordingly. But if GM resisted Drucker's commitment to the large corporation's role in its surrounding community, Concept of the Corporation the first book ever to identify social responsibility as a key por corporate concern ended up becoming the founding text of management studies. 
And by the time young executives at, of AT&T entered the Institute, the notion of employees as a resource to be developed, rather than merely as a cost, had gained a strong foothold. But as striking as the participants' community engagement is, there's more to be mined from the transcript. Beyond the th transcripts, beyond the three response patterns I've already noted, there are many general comments about finding more time for reading and finding more pleasure in reading. Can this change be attributed to liter literature instruction alone? Probably not, although one respondent discusses an increased interest in literature that he traces back to a teacher in the Institute who encouraged us to read, 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 and read at least 40 to 30,000 novels in our lifetime. He does not mention where his current count stands, but reports that he reads at least an hour every night and always has several books going. Another wishes that the pen spirit could have been kept alive in the Bell system. He introduced a circulating library in his branch and encouraged people to read books bearing on sociological change, including Sinclair Lewis's Main Street. Certainly, one could overread the influence of literature on all the changes reported in the transcripts. It would be a stretch, for instance, to attribute the repeated reference to learning to see through another eyes, another's eyes, to reading of Richard Kane about the parallax effects in Ulysses. Um, yet I believe I can detect something that actually might be a long-term residual effect. Uh, a plunging into literature ten years earlier in the remarks of one student executive. He is one of those who comments on his deepened interest in reading, but also explicitly discusses how literature can help business managers find what he calls perhaps a deeper understanding of human nature, in which he obviously sounds just like Pound and Renaissance humanism. Now this thought in itself is not terribly remarkable. It's been a standard defense of literature since Aristotle, and often reinvoked to throw in relief the seemingly autistic behavior of world leaders. Take the following comment by Charles Isherwood, a former chair of the Federal Reserve Bank in the United States, Alan Greenspan, who was reportedly surprised after the subprime mortgage crisis by, quote, the excess of greed on Wall Street. Isherwood exclaims, he didn't see that coming? I hereby recommend for top-tier econ uh, economists a crash course on what men and women are. But our student executive has more to say than this. I like to imagine that the sentence that immediately follows his remarks on human nature come after a pause. And here's one reason I'd like to listen to these, these tapes. Um, uh, as if the speaker is trying hard to articulate the value of his continuing interest in literature and the liberal arts, he says, we experience in literature as well as in the arts the pell-mell way that experience comes to us in real life with ideas and practice all muddled up in one complex. All in all, this is a pretty good account of the special kind of literary knowledge, I'd say, that cannot be registered in other disciplines, namely what could be called the historical aspects of intersubjectivity, the granular data about interpersonal relations that literature catches in its web. Ulysses, in particular, I would argue, is well suited to the affective dimension of information processing, which is not which is to say not only to the analytic task of picking apart what the transcript refers to as the pell-mell way that experience comes to us in real life with ideas and practice all muddled up in one complex, but also to the ways in which that process is always bound up in one complex with fine-grained affective states that find their most subtle expression in literature. Explicit references to reading Ulysses, as they remarked, do not surface in the transcripts, but the concept, uh, the comments of Institute instructor Mallory yet a useful distinction between identification and recognition, recently advanced by Rita Felsky in her book on the uses of literature. The two are often conflated, she says. Um, but Felsky, who links recognition with the reading of literature, observes that whereas identification often denotes a formal alignment with character, recognition does not imply fusion or repetition. It is a more capacious category that preserves interplay, sameness, and difference, and denotes not just the previously known, but the becoming known. In recognition, something that may have been sensed in a vague, diffuse, or semi-conscious way now takes on a distinct shape, is amplified, heightened, or made newly visible. Thus, when Mallory notes that the student executives showed great interest in Leopold Bloom as a person, perhaps as a representative of themselves, the word perhaps indicates that he is referring not to naive or reflexive identification, 
but rather to a process of recognition in which the students come to know themselves better through bloom. Beyond the literary per se, the value of the liberal arts more broadly also emerges in the transcripts. The quality of student executives' reflections 10 years after the fact, their self-conscious efforts to struggle with difficult questions, their willingness to ponder the relationship between the moral texture of their everyday lives and what initially felt like distant antecedents, all this exemplifies to me in a deeply impressive way not only what is meant by the examined life, but also the practical value called the usefulness of broadened horizons. The transcript also acknowledged the long-term difficulty of negotiating such ideals of reflection in the demands of corporate management. One executive reflects at length on what he feels may be one of the, quote, temporary disadvantages of the program. He says, it took me quite a while, he remarks, to get to the point of having a strong, sustained interest in some aspects of our measured performance, which interest I simply had to have because it was a requirement of my job. It took me some time to synthesize the warring elements of my two different worlds, or to strike a middle of the road course in which I'd be comfortable. As is typical, he can't think of a particular example in support of these thoughts, but he continues, about all I can add on the subject now is that I feel I finally got back my interest in measured results in my competitiveness, but it took time. It wasn't easy. And I did this mainly because I think I had to. The moment of, of the liberal arts for me is captured in the image of this executive with a microphone in his hand. I picture him in a study, isolated a pool of light from his desk, desk lamp, trying to think his way back to the past in order to bring something useful into the present and to make it available for the future. The specter of what threatens to foreclose this activity, the pressure to produce easily measurable results, brings us back finally to Bill Redding's and his fear almost 20 years ago in the University in Ruins that a consumerist ethos in the university was threatening to distinguish independent critical thought. And his argument is that through various processes of quantification and the loss of that goal of national subjects, the universities indulge in an empty discourse of excellence where excellence means absolutely nothing but beyond providing a point of comparison with other institutions about who's more excellent. Um, and so excellence sort of operates um, as the cash nexus, you could say. Um, uh, Redding's undoubtedly identified a major issue that remains with us today. But I also want to suggest that one of the things we can learn from the, in, the accountant enchanted by the music of Ulysses or from the student who considered the novel, the novel a shocking pile of dirt, but even more from the one who felt it would never again be a straw flipping down the current, is that there is no reason to believe that the unintended consequences of a liberal education or of modernism have disappeared over the last 50 years, or that they will in the future. If the Institute of, for Humanistic Study was, at one level of abstraction, part of the process through which, during the Cold War, Modernism was reframed as an affirmation of bourgeois Western values, and part of the process of institutionalization that Petrilling defanged modernism. As long as we pause to think about it, in the classroom, we're always doing more than we think. Thank you.